Thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce Gary and Rose Neeleman. Uh, Gary is a native of Salt Lake City, graduated from the University of, of Utah with a degree in fine arts and a minor in history and journalism. Uh, he was a missionary in Brazil for uh, about three years. After re returning from Brazil, he married his high school sweetheart, Rose Marine Lewis. Um, he worked for KSL Radio and Television for a number of years uh, while, he f while he finished his studies at the University of Utah. Uh, after he finished those studies, he accepted a job with United Press International, and Gary Rose and their firstborn son, John Raymond, returned to Brazil, where Gary worked as a foreign correspondent and journalist, uh, and ultimately the bureau manager for the United Press International. As one of the few American journalists living in Brazil during those years who spoke fluent Portuguese, he covered some of the most significant years in Brazil's modern political history. So think of the coup, think of the age of after Getulio Vargas and uh, Juan Perón in Argentina. So it's a, an incredible time to be down there. He reported on the regimes of three Brazilian presidents, traveled with international dignitaries, including President Eisenhower, General de Gaulle, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, among many others. He covered the 1964 military coup in Brazil and was awarded the Medal of Merit by the Professional Journalists Association for his accurate and professional coverage of the coup. Gary worked a total of 27 years for United Press International as rep reporter, bureau chief, and vice president of UPI over Latin America. Subsequently, he worked 17 years for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate and 10 for the Washington Post Syndicate. In 2015, he was awarded the Cidadão Paulustano, I'm sure that's my bad Spanish accent with the Portuguese, Honorary Citizen of Sao Paulo Award for his work with, Brazil, uh, with Brazilians over 50 years. In 2016, he was awarded the Rio Branco Medal of Foreign Ministry for his, also for his uh, work throughout his career. This is the highest award given by the Brazilian government. He has also been the Honorary Consul of Brazil in Utah for 18 years. Uh, Rose Marie Nieleman studied four years at the University of Utah, where she earned her Bachelor in Arts degree. She then her earned her Master's degree from Brigham Young University here. She taught a class in Family Relations for BYU for 20 years, during which time 20,000 women took her class. She authored the class text, Far Above Rubies, which was published by BYU Press. Rose had the unique experience and challenge not only of raising a young family in a foreign country, but also of supporting and accompanying her husband in his unusual and demanding work as a foreign uh, correspondent. She learned to speak, read, and write Portuguese, and has authored many articles on Brazil and on community education in the developing world. She has spoken in many church, educational, and women's groups throughout the hemisphere. Her master's project in community education in Bolivia resulted in a Charles F. Mott Foundation community education grant for Latin America, totaling over a million and a half dollars. And one of her greatest uh, achievements is that she is the double first cousin of my mother-in-law. <laughs> so kind of a small world there. But So we are very happy to have Gary and Rose here. They have seven children, 37, 36 grandchildren, 27 great-grandchildren. Many of them have dual Brazilian citizenship they have authored 10 books, three about Brazilian early history, a Brazilian cookbook in English, and two of the books have recently been awarded first place in the International Latino Book Competition in the category of Best History Book in English. These awards were for Rubber Soldiers, the ones that we'll hear about today, uh, as well as Tracks in the Amazon. And I have a Partial interest to people here at BYU, their, one of their grandsons is the quarterback for BYU, Zach Wilson. So we'll, we'll add that. We'll add that his mother is here. So without any, we could go on and on, but we'll end it there and let's uh, give them a big hand of welcome. Well, it's a great privilege to be back in B at BYU again, and I, I'm thrilled that we have four of our families represented here today, uh, and glad that our children and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren are able to be here today. I just would like to just sort of 
tell you a little bit about how we started writing these books about Brazil. When we lived in Brazil, when I'd go to someone's home to dinner and they had an incredible something to eat, I'd ask if they'd give me the recipe, and they were so good to do that. And so a few years ago, we published this book in Brazil by a university in Brazil, and uh, it the biggest, the people that buy this the most are Brazilians who live in the United States because this tells them what the ingredients they can buy and and uh, how they can, can make the Brazilian dishes that they so enjoy. When uh, we were in Brazil living, I just wanted to add one thing to your introduction, and that is that when Gary was invited to go back to Brazil or hired by United Press International, we had no idea what an incredible opportunity that was. We were young, uh, 23 years old, and uh, they offered Gary the job as a foreign correspondent. And I might just say that generally a journalist will work his whole life and then as a plum at the end get to go out as a foreign correspondent. But because of Gary's Portuguese, he was able to do that when he was just young. And it was an exciting time for us when we lived in Brazil. Well, while Gary was on his mission, he met a, a blonde, blue-eyed missionary speaking with a southern accent in both Portuguese and English. And he asked her what state she was from. And she said, oh, I've never been to the United States. And he said, will you speak like that? And she said, well, my, my family came here right after the Civil War. And uh, the, this book is not available in English yet. It's only in Portuguese. But it tells the story of the Americans who came here after the civil came went to brazil after the civil war and for those of you who have been on missions to brazil that's the people out near americana and they speak with that southern accent even if they aren't uh even if they don't come from those southern families and so uh as we were living in brazil well the 100th anniversary of the civil war came around and they sent a, a a message out to all the bureaus and said, do you have anything about the Civil War? We're doing a book. And uh, Gary remembered the blonde, blue-eyed missionary, and he called her and she said, well, you want to talk to my uh, co my cousin, Judith Jones. She's the, the historian of the group. So we loaded our kids in the car. David uh, Daniel was with us that day as a little kid, and we loaded the kids in the car and went out to the picnic of the Confederates. And we met Judith Jones and started a wonderful friendship with her. And through the years, we would trade information with her. When our oldest son was in college, he would, did research and got a lot of information from the southern states that we sent to Judith, and she would share things with us. And one day, as we were sitting in her garden, she handed Gary a tin can, and she said, uh, maybe you could use this. She said, I collect all this stuff for my museum, but I, I really don't need it, and gave it to Gary. Well, 25 years later, Gary came home one day from the office and said, do you remember that tin can Judith gave me? And I found it, found it. And it, what it was was some incredible pictures that were taken. Over 5,000 pictures were taken by uh, the way, by Wade Davis, who was no, a, Dana, a Dana Merrill. Dana Merrill by da oh. <laughs> by Dana Merrill, and the the pictures are almost lost because when the military government took over, either by accident or on purpose. They threw away, uh, someone said they saw them throwing the pictures into the river or, or the, and all the information. Well, we did find another album in the New York Library. We found, someone found one in Germany and there was one in Rio and that was the museum that just, was just burned. So we think maybe those pictures are lost. So 
what do you, we, we, we had also 20 newspapers, and as we sat and read those newspapers, the pictures fit. And so that's why we did this book, because it would be these amazing pictures by Dana Merrill and the newspaper account, and then our research. Well, while we were out doing that research out in the Amazon, the Brazilians began saying to us, well, that's great that we gave you all that rubber for the war, but when are you going to pay for it? And we thought, this is strange. If the United States didn't pay f Brazil for rubber that they owed him. And so we came home and we called the Hinckley Institute at the University of Utah and said, do you have anybody going back to work with a senator? And they said, oh, we have an incredible young man. He's going to be in Senator Hatch's office. And so we took him to breakfast, and we said, all we want is a piece of paper, just saying the United States paid X number of dollars to Brazil for this rubber. Well, can you remember his name right off the top of your head? <laughs> He's a lawyer now. I'll think of it after I get through. But anyway, so Goldman. during the time he was in... Danny Danny, Danny Daniel Goldman. Good one. No, Goldman. Goldman. Anyway, he, so during the time he was in Washington, and he would never take a penny for any of this, he would go to, into the Library of Congress and copy photos, copy documents. He had 300 pages that he'd copied for us. And he was cute. I, I said to him, you know, so many amazing things happened right happened writing this book and told him about some of them and he said oh I'm so glad you told me that he said I wanted to find that one paper you wanted and he said the last day I literally prayed that I'd find it I had two hours and he found it and it's in this book but someone hands you 300 documents and how do you not do this book you know when, and one of the interesting things, when we were doing the book, we knew Hitler wanted Brazil. They had a lot of Germans living there, and Hitler said, we will get Brazil for, as, an, as an axis in World War II, and then we'll have all we need. Well, we knew the United States were trying to get Brazil. Not only did they need the rubber, but they also started building air, for, air bases on where Brazil and, and Africa jut out together, and, and we knew they set up the big steel mill. And so, anyway, we, we were having lunch with the ambassador who had asked Gary to be the honorary consul, and I said, you know, we, we, the one thing we are missing for this book is how we got Brazil to be an ally when Germany was trying so hard for him to be an Axis, and, and we don't know how it happened. And his wife stood up and she said, oh, my grandfather was the foreign minister during that time, and his name was Aranha, which means spider in oh, Portuguese. Wow. And anyway, she said, and she, she brought a thing off the wall of Time Magazine with her dad, with her grandpa's picture, and we couldn't take it off open the, the frame, but I wrote down the date, and we found that magazine, and that, that was the story that we needed to, to find out that. So this, this, uh, this uh, rubber soldier book was, has been exciting to do. You know, when we start doing a book, it's, it's really amazing how things fall into place. For example, and I'm, we're just about ready to start talking more about rubber soldiers, but when we were in, in Brazil at last, by the way, we haven't missed a year in Brazil since Gary went there on his mission. He came home in 57, we were back in 58, and we haven't missed a year since. And uh, when we were there last, the publisher of the Portuguese book said, well, you've got to do one more book. What is it? He said, that piece of history when you were a foreign correspondent, hardly anything's been written about it. So uh, we, we uh, came home, and, and we need to go through our, all our files and look for more stuff. But we were having lunch with some UPI guys we meet with every month. And I said, if we can find all that material, then we'll do this one more book. And, this, and Peter Gillen said, duh. 
look in www.newspapers.com. So I got online and started searching and found 105 stories. And it's so exciting to see those stories. Some of the stories Gary covered were worldwide stories, and there are headlines from papers all over the world by Gary J. Neeleman, United Press International, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So as we start gathering things, it's amazing how everything just starts to fall into place. So we're working on that one last one. So we're going to talk now about rubber soldiers, the forgotten army that saved the Allies in World War II. Rose is my seeing eye, Rose. <laughs> well, she gave the accurate resume of how all of this came to be. <clears throat> of course, as those of you that know me and my kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids know, uh, we've been infatuated with Brazil our entire lives. I went down there uh, uh, when I was just a missionary uh, at 20 years of age, and we've not missed a year being there since. We were there in June of this past year and uh, had an opportunity to fly to uh, northern Brazil, the city of Fortaleza, uh, where we gave a speech uh, to 100 businessmen one hour, and three hours later, 500 lawyers. Now the interesting thing is that most of these people in Fortaleza, Brazil, are descendants of the original rubber soldiers that uh, went out into the jungle to gather rubber for the Allies in World War II. Very few people know that when the war broke out in 1941, the United States had less than three months of rubber in stock. And they started scrambling all over the world to find rubber sources. And it finally came to them that the only way that they could make up the difference of what they needed to build a war machine, uh, ships, planes, boats, everything you can imagine, tanks, tires, everything, was to find the rubber back in the Amazon, which had been the source of almost all world rubber up until 1913. Up until 1913, 97% of all the world's rubber came from wild rubber trees in the Amazon basin. And then when the Brits, Rose says they borrowed the seeds from the Amazon, I say they stole them, but the British had a philosophy, uh, which is kind of what it is today, that all of the world's resources do not belong to the countries wherein they lie, but the world's resources belong to humanity, but that the British have the responsibility of allocating those resources. <laughs> and that was the case with that rubber latex of the Amazon. They took 6,000 6, seeds from the Amazon and created a new rubber business in Indonesia and throughout Southeast Asia. And when those seeds began to blossom and create rubber plantations in Southeast Asia, it killed the rubber business in Brazil and it died. Actually, the connection there was that that little train that we talked about, tracks in the Amazon, the Madeira Mamoré Railroad, a 366 kilometer train that went from the Bolivian border to the, uh, to the middle of the Amazon basin where it picked up the rubber and then transported it to Manaus and down and out to sea. That little train finally ceased to operate as a uh, logistical source for rubber transportation during that period of time. And so the United States had to start looking for other ways of getting that latex, that rubber, out of the Amazon. And so they contacted the Brazilian president, Getulio Vargas. And he was a strong man. He had been president, he'd been dictator, and then president again. And in fact, coincidentally, when I arrived in Brazil in 1954, he had just committed suicide. 
And that was one of the stories, the aftermath of that suicide was one of the big political stories in Latin America during that period of time, which we later wrote about. But Getulio said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll give you the rubber. You'll have to pay for it. And so they set up a system, whereas the United States went into the jungle and they set up a huge latex gathering operation, which involved 55,000 rubber tappers from Brazil's northeast. There was a terrible drought in the state, in the northeastern states of Brazil, uh, up in Ceará, uh, the, the state of uh, Fortaleza, and uh, in the areas of Natal and the rest of those areas. And that drought was creating terrible problems for Getulio Vargas. So he figured he'd kill two birds with one stone and he'd send those people looking for ways of sustaining themselves back into the Amazon to tap rubber, which their early relatives had done at the turn of the century. So he sent 55,000 of those rubber tappers out there all underwritten by the United States government. Trains, trucks, uh, ships, everything. Took those people up the Amazon 600 miles into the rubber fields. And that's where they began to tap rubber. But the conditions were so terrible, you can't even imagine. 26,000 of these guys and their families died of malaria and yellow fever and other jungle ailments during their time in the jungle, tapping rubber during that period of time. 26,000, almost half of them that went up there. The other group that were recruited for the war effort uh, was the Brazilian Expeditionary Force that was sent to Italy. And these guys went as soldiers, and there were 25,000 of them. And of those 25,000, 450 died in comparison with those that died in the Amazon. But they were given a, a, a great deal of glory and recognition. The guys in the Amazon that died by the thousands were never really recognized, unfortunately. And as I've talked to Brazilians, uh, my good friend Brazilians, journalists and others, there was never any real proper recognition of these rubber tappers that had died in the service of their country and the service of the Allies. And so we went into that with 300 pages of documents from the United States Congress about the, uh, about the relationship between Brazil and the United States during that period of, of latex. And, uh, and then these people, uh, their families that were not repatriated, which was one of the promises, they built the cities along the Amazon. So in cities like Manaus and, uh, and Rio Branco and all along the Amazon and the, and the rivers that cover the whole Amazon basin, those little cities are all populated by the ex-rubber tapper and their, and their descendants. And when we would travel into the jungle, which we did on six or seven or eight occasions, we visited those little villages and those little towns, and we saw these people living in stark poverty and misery and no, no compensation yet for the sacrifices that they, they gave. And I said, this is wrong. This is, we must find a way. So when we wrote the Madeira Mamoré, the story of the little train. We were able to get a partial pension for the rubber tappers because of what we revealed in this book. We later published this book, The Rubber Soldiers, and Azul Airlines delivered one of these books to every Brazilian senator, which talked about how the United States paid $145 million in 1943 for the rubber that they extracted from the Amazon. That today would be worth $2.6 billion. But these people never got a, not a, not a nickel of it. They got nothing of it. But the book 
talks more about the war of the South Atlantic than has ever been talked about before. We all know about the war in the North Atlantic. We know about the war in the Pacific. Many of us have relatives that died in the war of the Pacific or the North Atlantic. But how many know about the South Atlantic? How many know, how many know that 3,500 merchant ships from Brazil, Britain, France, and the United States were sunk by German submarines in the South Atlantic during the Second World War. I don't think a soul that I know knew that that kind of conflict took place. Very few people know that the United States, when they entered the war in 1941, and they sent their submarine, anti-submarine uh, fleets down there to attack the German submarines, 900 German submarines were were finally sunk uh, in the South Atlantic that were moving out of the River Platte from Argentina where they had an ally and were sinking. We took, we went to Uruguay and saw the Gospir, the great big German battleship that sits right in the harbor of Montevideo. The conning towers of that boat still visible from the, the beaches of Ponta del Este. And that is a great story, how the two British cruisers chased that German battleship. They called them a pocket battleship, but they were raiders. And they, they were after all of these commercial uh, ships in the South Atlantic during that war. And uh, they chased them into the, ba into the bay of uh, Montevideo and uh, cornered it there. And the, sh the ship was not... Uh, convinced that the British Navy wasn't sitting outside the harbor ready to attack it when it came out and they didn't want it recovered because it had violated all of the treaties of Versailles in its construction. It had heavy armored plate. It had guns that could shoot 10 miles, 15 miles. All these things that were, were, were developed by the Germans at that time uh, against the Treaty of Versailles from the First World War. And so that big ship sat there for a week or two while it communicated with Berlin to find out what to do. And finally, Hitler decided that that ship could not leave the harbor because it would be caught uh, and captured by the British Navy. And there were only two little cruisers out there that were guarding the harbor. So he ordered the ship to self-destruct. So the captain sent all the crew members into Buenos Aires on, on boats, and then he uh, blew up the ship itself. And later in Buenos Aires, he committed suicide. But that was one of the, the big uh, episodes that took place down in that, in that uh, part of the South Atlantic during that period of time. But as a result of the agreements, which they called the Accords, which were written and agreed upon by Brazil and the United States on March the 3rd, 1942, there were many changes in Brazil. In the city of Natal in uh, northern Brazil, right on the bulge, there is the largest U.S. military base of the, war, of the war. Bigger than anything in Asia, bigger than anything in Europe, the Natal air base is monolithic. And the United States was able to defeat the Germans in North Africa because their B-24s and their B-25s could fly from the Brazilian bulge to North Africa without refueling. And they were able to attack the Germans in the Sahara. And so as a result, the Germans were stopped cold in North Africa. And that was the beginning of the German decline. And it was because of that base in Natal. So when I was in Natal uh, interviewing people up there about it, many of them now 80, 90, that worked on the base, uh, I, would, I interviewed a taxi driver. And I said to him, Senor, tell me, did you have anything to do with the American aviators that uh, operated off this base? And he said, oh yes, I did. We sold them things, and we negotiated, and had all kinds of business. I said, what'd you do? And he said, well, 
they all like turkey because they have a Thanksgiving, they call. And uh, we didn't have turkey in Brazil. And de facto, when I got to Brazil in 1954, there were no turkeys in Brazil. It was not an industry. It was a chicken or nothing. And so I said to this guy, so what'd you do? We went to the dump and we killed 24 vultures and we sold them <laughs> to them for turkeys. And I said, what'd they say? <laughs> he said, the worst turkey they ever ate in their lives. <laughs> and from that base, south down to all the coastal cities of Brazil, there were American air bases that were there to protect Brazil and to protect the Allies and the invasion of the Germans into southern South America. So the war of the South Atlantic was one that was very, very sparsely reported on during that period of time. When I was there as a correspondent in, uh, in Brazil, I covered the story of Adolf Eichmann. And most of you that are older would know the story of Adolf Eichmann, who was responsible for the extermination of over six million Jews in prison camps. And he was uh, in Buenos Aires. And uh, I found out that he was there. A plane flying from Buenos Aires uh, to Recife, Brazil, and from Recife to Dakar in Africa, uh, came through Brazil one night. And I was in my office and I received a phone call that it was a Jewish plane, an Israeli plane, that had been stopped in uh, Rio and then stopped again in Recife. And they didn't know why. And I thought it might be a violation of airspace. And uh, when we checked on it, uh, all of a sudden, a week later, the Israelis announced that Adolf Eichmann had been found in Egypt. But a German SS person that lived in Sao Paulo by the name of Mario Bush, who was a guy I knew very well because he worked for Real Aerovias Airlines, came in my office and said, the Israelis are lying. He was picked up in a suburb of Buenos Aires and that he lived in Tucumán province in northern Argentina. And I checked on it, sent a stringer up there, and we discovered that that was where Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann lived. So these war criminals were all over South America during that period of time. They were in Brazil, they were in Argentina, they were in Chile, they were in Uruguay, they were in Paraguay. And so that was all part of that whole thing because Hitler had assumed, because he had that kind of support system in southern South America that he was going to be able to, uh, to control that area which was rich in resources and iron ore. The United States also provided the huge steel mill which exists today in Brazil, uh, Volta Redondo, which is the largest steel mill in South America, was built by the Americans as part of the agreement with uh, Getulio Vargas. So all of those things that, that Brazil was able to negotiate as part of their uh, deal for uh, Brazilian rubber uh, are talked about in this book. These are things that very few people know about or historians talk about. Uh, but they're all there evident and we have great pictures in the book as well. So as we have published this book, we've given maybe 15, 20 presentations in Brazil, and the Brazilian historians are flabbergasted at some of the information that we've been able to uncover uh, regarding that, uh, that rubber thing. Wade Davis, who is one of the most well-known and renowned uh, historians of the Amazon Basin, is a personal and very close friend of ours who has reviewed all of our work. The, the book of the uh, Amazon, the book on the train, and also the rubber soldiers. He is a professor uh, at the University of, uh, uh, in Vancouver, and uh, we've talked to him about it and consulted with him on this, and he said these facts that we have been able to uncover 
while we've written these books and talked to Brazilian historians and others are absolutely critical to understanding how important South America was to, uh, to the Axis as well as to the Allies. When we saw the descriptions of how the rubber tappers were transported up the Amazon to the rubber fields during that period of time, it was absolutely uh, amazing. They would take the ships that were provided by US, the US government, many of them old destroyers and uh, other merchant ships, and they would carry these people up the Amazon to the rubber fields where they would begin uh, tapping rubber. And the excruciating effort to tap rubber from wild rubber trees, the description was beyond belief. They would get up at three in the morning, two in the morning, go out and put a little tin can on a tree. They would drip latex into that can until eight or 10 o'clock at night. In the pitch black, they'd come back and gather their can, and then they would take it back to their home where it was in the jungle, and they would boil that latex in a uh, fire, and then they would pour it onto a ball, a 55-pound rubber ball, and on a stick. And then in a couple of days, the sitting gators would pick up those balls of rubber and take them down the river, and in many cases have to float them down. But the agony of those people and their effort to survive was beyond belief. One of the great stories that we, we have in the book is about a 14-year-old girl in the Amazon that uh, met a rubber tapper that came from Sierra, the state of Sierra in the north of Brazil. And he promised her that if she would marry him, he would be able to find a treasure in the jungle. Uh, while he was tapping rubber. And so, and she was telling this, this story to uh, Iran de Silva, who was a good friend of ours that we were, we were uh, researching with him. He was a lawyer. And she was 94 years old at that time. And she told the story about how she married this guy. And that one day when he was out tapping rubber in the middle of the jungle, he stepped on a fish in a river that slashed his foot open, and uh, as a result, he was literally incapacitated. So he went back to his little hut, and he told his little wife, 14 years old, that to find another man because she would not be able, he would not be able to take care of her. And uh, she said, "Look, I didn't marry you to just leave you when you're in trouble. I'm going to stay with you." And so for 18 months. She dressed up like he did, like he was, as a rubber tapper, and would go out in the jungle carrying his shotgun and his bucket and tap rubber in his stead so that they wouldn't lose their income. And one night, she met two guys on the, on the trail, and uh, they threatened her, and she pointed the gun at them, and she said, that a voice came out of her that was from heaven because it was a loud and, and threatening voice that scared these two guys off into the jungle. And they never bothered her again, but she came back and told her husband about what happened. And so another couple of months went by, and one morning she woke up and he'd gone. And she looked around at 3 o'clock in the morning and he'd left. And... Uh, so she wondered if, if he felt that he was well enough to go out again, but then later at 8 o'clock at night he came back in and he had a bucket of latex. And he said to her, I felt that I could do it now and uh, thank you for all you did. But he said, I found the treasure. She said, you did? What was it? And he said, the treasure was you. <laughs> Every time Gary tells that story, it gets him. She was going to come to our book signing when we were out there in that area, and she fell and broke her hip. 
and wasn't able to be there, but they had another person read the story out of the book for her. And they did a little play. They had a little chorus a little of women singing the clothes they the song they sang as they washed their clothes in the river. But it in the Amazon River. Amazing get to know those people. Corey, do we need to stop for questions now? Okay. Anybody have a question? Say it in Portuguese Sim, fala, if you fala, want to. Fala português. Well, well, he, her grandfather was uh, a, a survivor of the rubber soldiers. When I was a little boy, he to told about attacks by Indians and by animals and all kinds of things while he was out there. Trying to tap the tap rubber. rubber. <laughs> He, said, he, would, he couldn't even sleep at night just imagining what was going to happen. I never read or heard in school anything about all of this. The story was just literally smothered in Brazil. Nobody ever talked about it. Yeah. It, it, they didn't want it to, to make the government and others uncomfortable. Because we felt that he wants to know why we decided, two Americans decided to, to do this book that revealed all of these things of Brazilian history which has never been told in Brazil itself. Well, the lawyer in Brazil said he thought we were very courageous to write this book. And we felt that the injustice of the treatment of these 55,000 rubber tappers multiplied by their many, many thousands of family members that suffered in order to make that sacrifice needed some kind of justice. In the agreement that was made with the men when they were sent out there, they agreed to give them, I think, 6% of what they got from the United States, and they agreed to send them back to their homeland. They didn't do any, any of it. Any of it. They, they never didn't. completed any of those promises. And it was almost a slavery kind of work because they, they were would, indentured. They, they, they were, they'd do those big balls and then they'd go to the headquarters and they'd get food and other equipment. But that was so overpriced and the rubber so underpriced that they could never they leave. They could never catch up. And they if could they'd never try get to out of sneak that. away, they'd shoot them. There was another story of, uh, that we have in the book, just briefly, about this guy that got sick. And so his friend heard his two supervisors saying that they were gonna throw him in the river the next morning. So he said, nobody's gonna throw my friend in the river. So he put him on his back, and for 30 days he, he carried him on his back through the middle of the jungle. Running with the Running with his him. friend. And he threw their guns in the, in, the, in the river before he left. And they were chasing him the whole time. <laughs> but then he finally stopped in a clearing where a, a big Brazilian animal, one of the, a sort of a big sloth, was digging a hole in, in the middle of the ground because he would sleep in the, in the cool of the earth uh, at night. But he said that the guy that was dying had had a dream that he would be buried in a uh, peaceful place and that he would have a white cross on his grave and he died that night so his friend that had carried him for 30 days buried him in that uh, gray in that hole by the that the animal had dug and put a cross on his grave uh, to complete that 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 dream that that man had but I mean, the stories are just endless. We've had, in the book, we've talked about the stories, endless stories, but these rubber tappers, and I can say this, 
that the ones we met and the ones we associated with were absolutely fabulous people, honest, hardworking, most of them not able to even read and write, even to this day. And so we've put this book and the uh, train book in audio, and they can now listen to it and hear these stories about their ancestors. Let me just say that the, our favorite thing about Brazil is the Brazilian people. Not just the rubber tappers, but Brazilians in general. They're the n sweetest, nicest, most wonderful people you'd ever find. And uh, the church has grown so fast because those people are, are so innocent and anxious to, to learn that it's just been incredible. When Gary got there on his mission, there were 1,900 members. Now there's a million, 400,000, I believe. And we, in, in Fortaleza, where we gave a speech to 500 lawyers and 100 businessmen just in June, there was not a single member of the church in that area. Today, there are 50,000 members of the church, 100 wards, 17 stakes, and a temple in just that period of time. But these amazing people, the sweetness of these people, in spite of the corruption that, lives, that exists in Brazil on the upper levels, the people themselves are fantastic. And uh, the people we dealt with out in the Amazon, the people we went into the villages where these little rubber tappers lived. One guy was 107 that we talked to in a wheelchair. Still waiting for money. Still waiting <laughs> for, for the money. rubber. <laughs> and so we, we felt an obligation to do, while we are still able to, to write these books, to tell these stories. And, uh, and we did, and they've been published in Portuguese. This is an English copy of the book by Schiffer Publishing out of Pennsylvania. And this one by the University of Utah Press. But it's one of those... Uh, things that we felt an obligation to do because we love the Brazilians. Right here. <laughs> It never went, made it, it to the people. Uh, to, uh, to repeat the question, he just said he wondered about how the money was paid, uh, that it was paid but never got to the people. It was put into the Bank of Brazil. In fact, before a shipment would leave, the United States had money in the bank, and the money for the, each shipment was pulled out before it ever left Brazil. Yeah, there are several lawsuits going on right now from uh, the Amazon against the government of Brazil to, uh, to pay those, uh, to repatriate that money to those people in some way. And it's been taken to the, uh, to the international courts, and uh, we don't know the, the status of it right now, but it's going on. But they say that the two... My, s s chunks of money that go to the men monthly came as a result of these two books. So they get a pension. Now uh, uh, they, gave, they got a half pension. Now they're getting a full pension after all these years, which is a little bit to, to compensate for what they have not had in the years past. I know some are going to have to leave for class. So what if, what if Close right here. Please join me in thanking Rose and Gary.